Thank you for attending. Um, I'm actually reporting on a project that a student of mine did, a PhD student called Jordan Chan, and she um, doesn't like aeroplanes. And to get here from Australia requires an aeroplane, so she didn't come. She asked me to do it for her. What I'm talking about is, is I, I'm a little concerned, maybe not concerned, but, but it, it has occurred to me that, that we're starting to categorise companion animal ownership by focusing on how they compensate for deficiencies. So what you would have heard quite a lot at this conference and at other conferences is that if you're lonely, you should get a companion animal. If you're depressed, you should get a companion animal. If you have autistic spectrum disorder, you can benefit from interacting with animals. Same for if you have attention deficit disorder or if you're getting old or you're just lonely or you have mental illnesses and all of those other ailments that affect people in the world today. We know that companion animals help all of them, and that's terrific to know, but we end up thinking of our companion animals as being kind of like a modern day first aid kit. So when we have something wrong with us, we wheel out an animal and we feel better about our lives. And that's really important, but I don't think it's everything. Okay? So it's difficult to reconcile that model with companion animal ownership statistics. I, I'm not going to trot out the numbers because I'm assuming that you all know them, but a bunch of people own companion animals. And it would be difficult to say that that many people in our community have the sort of deficiencies that we think companion animals are good for. Now, as a psychologist, I can tell you it's probably true that a third of our population are depressed and stressed and unhappy and benefit from their animals for that reason. But, I, but it doesn't reconcile with me comfortably that everybody who owns a companion animal has something wrong with them that they're compensating for. It's also really difficult to reconcile with the fact that it's becoming more and more difficult to own particularly dogs in our community in Australia and from what I'm hearing from other communities as well. The regulations and the, the resources that you need to keep dogs now, be, you know, they're quite becoming a privileged um, ownership thing. It costs a lot to own a dog. You, it's no longer enough just to have them living with you. You now have to provide them with toys and beds and holidays and, and all that kind of stuff. So, and I don't think it's the most disadvantaged members of our population who are doing this. Right? Th these are people who are functioning pretty well. So an alternative explanation for dog ownership, and one that we've heard a fair bit at th this conference, is that they're not kept for utilitarian reasons at all. We don't keep our dogs because we're lonely and depressed. We keep them because they're a member of our family. And again, I think that's kind of true, but for me, that explanation isn't good enough because I don't know what it means. Right? If you say that a dog is a family member, to me that's a descriptive term. It doesn't explain anything. Why is the dog a... What does that mean to say that a dog is a family member? Does it mean that it's a child substitute or a spouse substitute or, or what? And, and so I get a bit confused about explaining what it means by being a member of the family. And it still seems to presume that dog owners are deficient in some kind of way. So we get dogs to be part of our family because our families aren't quite right. And that may be true again, but I don't think it's good enough. I don't think it's a good enough explanation. So I'm worried about that. So maybe it, it is true that we're all deficient. Like I said, I'm okay with that. The, everybody that I know is anxious and depressed and miserable. So <laughs> no, that just may be where I'm situated in the world, but it's kind of true. We do have skyrocketing rates of all those things because we're living probably in such an unnatural environment for humans, we do have huge problems with mental illness and social problems. And maybe we are all deficient, you know, compared to what we would have been if we'd lived a few hundred years ago. Maybe we do need to recreate our family structures because we don't have the sort of families that we are biologically predisposed to have. We don't live in extended family groups with kids everywhere and, and, and brothers and sisters and grandparents and we're very isolated, maybe we do need to do that. But maybe there are other explanations for dog ownership and that's what I'm interested in today. How do we find out? So Jordan came along and when I met Jordan, she was one of these unusual students. She's a very successful consultant psychologist. She lives a uh, four hours plane ride away from where I am. So I'm in the bottom of Australia, she's in the top. We met maybe three times during her PhD. She did a PhD for fun because she had enough money and enough time to spend some time doing something she really wanted to do and she did a PhD for fun. She also is the owner of two wonderful Rhodesian Ridgebacks that she's absolutely devoted to. And that was the question she came in. Why am I so devoted to these dogs? Why are my friends all devoted to their dogs when we are very successful people? We earn lots of money, we have good relationships, we have everything we want and yet we dote on our dogs. Why is this? So she sent out to find that out and this was a mixed mode study. So the first thing she did was a questionnaire and it showed that people who were you know, happy and well-balanced and rich loved their dogs just as much as everybody else did. 
And I'm not going to report that today because we would expect to find that. So she then did a qualitative study. And she, what she did was she found 37 adult participants, really highly educated. Nearly all of them had PhDs or equivalent. They were all healthy. They were all in senior professional roles, so they were all getting six-figure salaries. They were living with a partner. Many of them had family, children with them. So these were people who we thought were pretty high-functioning. About two-thirds of them were female, and they were all about 30 to 40 years old. So, you know, the, the, the <coughs> perfect person. In, you know, everything was going right in their life. And yet they scored above average on a measure of how important their dog was to them in terms of close companionship. So they're the people that she, she got in her study and she went and interviewed them. It was a fairly loosely structured interview. So she started off with tell me how your dog came into your life and to what extent does the dog participate in your daily life. And then she had a list of questions that she could refer to if she wanted but really they were allowed to take the, the running with the interview. They were conducted in business settings, the dog wasn't there. Jordan, one of the things she noticed was as soon as started, she would walk in and it would be quite formal, she would be in a business suit, they would be in a business suit, and they'd start talking about the dog and their whole attitude would change and they'd go all mushy. Right? And you know that, you've done that yourself, right? It changes how, just talking about our dogs change how we feel. So we, we, she got all these, these interviews, we analysed them, we transcribed them, we put them in a program called Envivo and she used what's called an interpretative phenomenological technique. And I don't know much about qualitative research, we were inventing this as we went along. But pretty much what she did was put all the statements that anybody in her interview made into a computer program and then and looked through them and tried to understand what they meant and stuck tags on them and kept tagging them and kept tagging them and keep going over and over and over again, trying to make them into categories that fit together in some way. And then she could select the tag and have a look at all the comments that went into that. So I'm going to talk about four sort of things, themes that came out of this analysis. And one is we were interested in what this term companionship means. So everybody that was in our study said that they had a dog for companionship and we wanted to know what that meant. And when you go to the literature and you look for what does it mean, these are the sort of def definitions that you get. So Strasdens and Broom in 2007 said that companionship, they were talking about human companionship, is about giving and receiving attention, warmth, appreciation and doing things together for the benefit of all parties. Jonathan Hayden, in his really terrific book called The Happiness Hypothesis, he says it's about showing care to one another, building feelings of happiness, belonging, sharing experience, those sort of things. What these definitions share is an emphasis on the intimacy of the relationship. So the next thing we did was go back to the literature and looked for models of psychological intimacy. What does it mean to say that a relationship is intimate? And there is a classic text on this. If you're teaching about intimacy, this is the text that most people use, called Intimate Relationships, written by Brem et al. And they argue that intimate relationships between people consist of six different dimensions, and these are the dimensions. So knowledge of each other, caring for each other, interdependence, mutuality, trust and commitment. We went looking amongst our themes that we had on the computer at that point, and what we found is that our participants recorded those themes, all of them. Okay, so I'm just going to give you example quotes. That I don't have graphs, this is, I just have quotes. These are the kind of quotes that we got in terms of knowledge of each other. So basically, he will read when you are feeling grumpy or sad, and I do think that he trims his behaviour to the mood. So our participants think that their dog knows them, and on the other hand, they know their dog as an individual. So we do lots of little games. I'll often let her walk in front of me, and then I'll jump, and then I'll jump out again. You all do this with your dogs, right? You know your dog and your dog knows you, okay? So that knowledge of each other is part of being intimate. Caring for each other is another one. So I always make sure she doesn't have to lie on the ground, right? She always has to have her bed pulled out, her mattress pulled out, like when, when she's watching TV, so she's comfortable. And when she's cold, she's even allowed on the bed. Like, that was amazing, but of course, most of our dogs were allowed on the bed. <laughs> so, and, and then the other side of it, again, the dog caring for me. So it's interesting, I spent the last couple of days away at a conference and when I came back, she was glad to see me and my wife said um, when I was away, he wouldn't go to bed. He was concerned that I wasn't home when I should have been home. And so I'm caring about the, pet, the dog, the dog's caring about me. Interdependence. So she depends on me and I depend on her for love and affection. That's a two-way street. Simple, right? very simple. And I think he gets a lot of love. Now, I know he gets a lot of love and I, he would have to sense that about me. It's this interdependent relationship where I'm loving the dog, the dog's loving me back and we're all living happily ever after. Mutuality, it's about cooperation. So our <coughs> dogs don't do what they're told because we tell them to, they do it because they want to. 
we have this mutual relationship. I don't feel like I'm controlling her. She does things I ask, but of course she wants to. I don't know if that's true or not, but this is what our owners were telling us, okay? That's what you do in a two-way quality relationship, don't you? And that's what they were saying. And she just loves to be with me. She loves company. She wants to be around me. She would much rather be with me than anywhere else. And certainly that's how I feel about my dogs. They would sooner be with me in an uncomfortable position than be in a comfortable position somewhere else. So I think that's true. Trust also. So he's very constant. He doesn't change. He's always happy, always wants to play, happy to have a cuddle, all those sort of things. I can trust my dog. He's very stable. And on the other hand, my dog trusts me. So she puts her whole trust in me and I feel quite responsible about that. And commitment is the last one. So he was a person who had... Um, Drop back and remember these are very well off people, these are not people who are desperate for money, who had cut back on the work, her work hours so she could spend more time with her dog because she felt that that was important. The general approach is you don't have a pet if you're not going to be around on the weekend, if you're not going to put time. And we heard again and again and again stories about people who wouldn't go on holidays because they didn't want to leave their dog or they would tailor their holidays around the dog and, and really go out of their way to fit the dog into their life. So in all six of those, what we've got now is evidence that that the, the, the relationship between these very successful people and their dogs was very intimate. The second thing that we, we explored was that, that the dogs were enhancing people's quality of life. So if you read up on ha happiness theory, there's uh, Martin Seligman's written quite a lot on what's called authentic happiness theory, what makes people happy. And when Jordan did her thesis, there were three things that were thought to be critical. There's five now, but there were three. And that was positive emotions and engagement and meaning. And again, companion dogs meet all of these. So positive emotions, he's an absolute addict for being scratched on the tummy. He turns into Myrtle the turtle and he lies on his back and says, OK, I'll give you six years to stop. And I end up laughing my head off for about five minutes and I forget all my problems. Right? Exactly that, right? Again, we're always touching him. He likes to be touched. I really enjoy spending time with my dog. Okay? Positive emotions. Engagement. So engagement is... The, the way that we talk about engagement is something that takes you out of yourself and makes you concentrate, makes you forget who you are and all your troubles and stuff. And again, you pick her up and you tickle her or you pat her and you talk to her and you say good morning and I check down to, and I sit down and spend five minutes checking her for ticks and that takes my full attention and the rest of the world goes away. That's what we mean by engagement. And meaning I've already talked about in terms of the trusting and the, you know, I get out of bed in the morning to care for my dog. Really important sort of thing. Really important relationship. The other two things that have come into the newest conceptualisation of authentic happiness are close relationships. We don't need to worry about that with dogs. We've already got that, right? We've, we've and the, the fifth one is goal achievement. And I think dogs can fit into that as well. We do things, we do activities with our dogs where we set goals and we, we set out to achieve them. The third theme that emerged is the importance of unconditional love. And, of course, we all know this. This is not a new thing. Right? We've been talking about this for years, particularly in respect to people who are disadvantaged, people who are not doing so well in the world, people who have mental illness, but it's equally important to our successful professionals. So no matter what mood you're in, your dog will always show you that they love you, they'll always greet you with the same enthusiasm, same level of consistency, same level of joyful expression. I don't think you can get that from people. So these were people who were very successful in their work and family lives, but they still get more unconditional positive regard from their dogs than from anybody else. And again and again that theme came out in our interview transcripts that the dog is special, not another family member, special, quite different in, in terms of this unconditional love. And the fourth one, and this is one that, that I think is really important and I don't think we spend enough attention on it, and it's come out a couple of times in this, th in this conference. I heard Brenda talking this morning and she was mentioning this as well. Thank you. His dogs as role models. So with Lily, as with most dogs, if you get angry with her, it's only just seconds before she's happy again. She just gets over it and it doesn't happen with people. Same with it's loyalty that counts. Right? Sometimes, we, sometimes we'd be better off getting all the people off the planet and just having all the dogs, right? apart from me, of course. And, and this is an important thing. So people see it as a role model and I think our community is really lacking in role models. So we used to worship our politicians, we used to worship our celebrities, we used to worship in Australia its football stars and they constantly let us down. They are constantly doing the wrong thing, falling off their pedestals, making us feel bad and dogs don't do that. So the big difference with dogs is that they stay up there and they model these characteristics of loyalty and trust and affection and tolerance and all those things we wish we were more like. And I think that the owners see that as being really important. So 
I believe she brings out the best in me. I feel emotionally freer to express myself when I'm with her, except for when I'm with my partner. Okay? So I'm going to whiz through a few slides because I'm out of time, so just give me a sec. As usual, I talk so long. Why is it important? I think, yes, dogs do serve as modern first aid kits. They are terrific for a whole lot of ailments, a whole lot of things are going wrong. Yes, I think they're highly valued as family members, but I don't think they're the same. I think they're special in, in lots of people. They're, they're more important than some of their family members. So I also think they serve as psychological assets, which are enriching already rich lives. Even if you are the most successful person on, on earth, a dog still gives you something, a psychological asset to your life, and I think that that's really important. And I think it fits in, for those of you who are psychologists, it fits into Maslow's hierarchy really well that these are people who are up the top of the scale and their dog is still helping them reach their full potential and be creative and stuff like that. So this is the model. I'm finishing, Beth. This is the model. We have this companionship based on the psychological intimacy of the relationship and around that, surrounding that psychological intimacy, we have unconditional positive regard and that's leading to enhanced psychological health and resilience and we know that. Every psychologist on earth knows that. The most important thing is unconditional positive regard. We have this positive experience and engagement and meaning and that leads to an enhanced quality of life and a better work-life balance and all that kind of stuff. And over here we have these virtue qualities that are modelled by dogs and that I think leads to enhanced potential for self-actualisation. So one final quote. I, I just think everyone has to have a dog. We were driving home yesterday and there were all these people out there walking their dogs and I was commenting that they're just there trotting along with you, so loyal, it's just a beautiful thing. Thank you.